the Star Wars film franchise has brought with it a few traditions. Each new film is accompanied by an array of toys, with the three and three quarter inch figure range garnering the most excitement, making of or art of books are must have companions, and no merchandise release is complete without one other thing, the comic book adaptation. There is no doubt that the release of Star Wars in 1977 was a game changer, not just for cinema, but also for how a film was promoted, specifically through the medium of toys. When the first Star Trek film was released in 1979, it was accompanied by a range of three and three quarter inch figures. There's no doubt that these figures wouldn't have even been considered without the success of Kenner's Star Wars line. But those Star Wars figures were released after the film. What was released before it to build anticipation? Well, the very first bit of merchandise was comic book related. At the San Diego Comic Book Convention of 1976, before shooting on the film had even finished, you could buy your very own Star Wars poster, illustrated by Howard Chaikin, for the princely sum of $1.75. In November of that year, the novelization of the film was released. Credited to George Lucas, it was actually written by Alan Dean Foster, who would go on to write a few more Star Wars novels including the original sequel, Splinter of the Mind's Eye, and the novelization of The Force Awakens. Then, in April of 1977, more than a month before the film was released to American cinemas, the comic book adaptation hit newsstands. A comic book adaptation was seen by Lucas as an effective way to publicize the film to a demographic seen as a significant chunk of their target audience. So how did Marvel get the gig? Well, the rights to publish an adaptation were offered to other companies originally, such as DC Comics, but they refused, as did Marvel at the first time of asking. A year later, after George Lucas personally requested the creative team of writer Roy Thomas and artist Howard Chaikin, Marvel gave the project the go-ahead. Roy Thomas was instrumental in this. George Lucas was a fan of his work on Conan the Barbarian, and after meetings between Thomas and members of the Star Wars production team, he persuaded Stan Lee to approve the adaptation. Lucas was also a fan of Howard Chaikin's work, particularly on the science fiction anthology comic Star Reach. For an artist who worked for both of the big two companies, he somehow managed to avoid any long runs, with his stint on Star Wars up to issue 10 being one of his longest. He also wrote for both comics and TV, although more so for DC than for Marvel. As has been said, the comic was released before the film, and work on it began before the film had been completed. So Howard Chaikin had to base some of his work on concept art or unfinished scenes, which led to some interesting moments in the comic. The creative team were assembled, the printing presses were rolling, and on the 12th of April 1977, the first ever Star Wars comic was released. Now before you say anything, yes, it's a facsimile copy. The original issue one is massively overpriced. I promise I will never use another facsimile copy for a review, unless we have a look at, say, Amazing Fantasy 15. Howard Chaikin's cover has echoes of that promotional poster from the previous year. And it is odd seeing Star Wars described as a film by George Lucas. Not to mention the fact that the good guys are holding red lightsabers. Let's crack it open. Knowing how comics have changed over the years, I can tell you exactly how this would have looked had it been released in the modern day. The first page would have been all black, with just text on it, which of course would have been the opening crawl for Star Wars. And then Overleaf, you'd have found a two page splash of just one image, and that would have been that iconic opening shot of the Star Destroyer uh, chasing down the Tonti IV. This came out in 1977. Of course, we open with the correct uh, opening scene, but it's from a totally different perspective. In fact, we are looking back on the Star Destroyer. But nonetheless, it is chasing down that Rebel Cruiser. We are told the two vessels uh, are then joined together by grappling rays. Not a tractor beam, you moron. And then, as the stormtroopers board the Rebel ship, we see C-3PO and R2-D2 for the first time. And 3PO says, This is madness, R2. Uh, no. I think you find the first line is, Did you hear that? There's then a bit of banter between the two droids, as Freepo says, I should have known better than to trust the logic of a half-sized thermocapsulary de-housing assister. I don't remember that line from the film. But of course in these days, 
Once the film had finished its theatrical run, there were no videos, no DVDs, no internet. So if you wanted to relive the film, you could only do it by reading the novelization, which was pretty dire, or from reading the comics. So you can imagine that people would think that was a line from the film. Oh, you remember that time when Free Press says to R2, I should have known better than to trust the logic of a half-sized thermocapsular de-housing sister. Brilliant. Um, but of course it didn't happen. And there are lots of examples, uh, as you'll find on YouTube, um, of old films where lines have been misquoted. And it's down to the fact that once they were seen, that was it. You, you, you couldn't relive them for, for many years until they were on TV or until the dawn of video. Either that, of course, or it's uh, two dimensions crossing over. Could be either, couldn't it? Speaking of things that people wouldn't have seen in the original film, we now have a deleted scene as we head to Tatooine and we meet our hero, Luke Skywalker, for the first time. And he's wearing that god-awful hat that he seems to wear in all of those deleted scenes that haven't been put back in to the special edition. We're only with him briefly as he watches the battle in space from Tatooine before we then uh, return to the rebel ship. And now, not only the stormtroopers, but Darth Vader has boarded. And we see him, we're all familiar with this scene, aren't we? We see him lift up the rebel trooper and ask him where the uh, stolen tapes are. Then, of course, he utters one of his classic lines as he tells the stormtroopers to tear the ship apart and find the passengers of this vessel. I want them alive! And this is one of the examples where it's so difficult to read this comic and not hear the voice of James L. Jones in your head, or, or any of the characters for that matter. C-3PO and R2 de Toa have found Princess Leia, and she's depositing her message inside R2. Shortly after which time, the droids find the escape pod and use that to get away from the ship. Leia, of course, is discovered by stormtroopers, and as one of them shouts out that he's found them and to st set weapons for stun, she says, I've set mine to kill. Great comeback. We of course see her um, stunned by the stormtroopers before again returning to Tatooine. And again, it's another deleted scene. This time we see Luke going into Anchorhead. And whilst he's there, he meets up with his friends such as Beaks Darklighter, Cammy, uh, uh, and Fixer, who were completely dropped from the film. And they refer to him as Wormy, this nickname he has, which I'm glad that wasn't reintroduced into the special edition. Back in space, uh, Oh, okay, so is the Ton T4 not inside the Star Destroyer? But they're still on the Ton T4? That's weird. They do change a few of the lines here, which isn't really a big issue. Uh, for example, we've got one here, uh, and this is the first time that Princess Leia comes face to face with Darth Vader. And he says, Several transmissions were beamed to this ship by spies, who are now, unfortunately, dead. <gasps> Rogue One. We then return to Tatooine. Get used to this. And on Tatooine, we find the droids. And this is a nice rejigging because uh, we have this scene, don't we, where they go their separate ways. We see R2-D2, we see C-3PO separately. But they've rejigged it nicely, all to all fit on one page. And what we have is C-3PO's uh, lines spoken whilst we see R2-D2 and what happens to him. Then it's time for another deleted scene as we see Luke with Biggs again. Talk about the fact that Biggs has uh, now joined up, hasn't he? And Luke wants to, but he's stuck on this boring planet. Before we go back to space, uh, and it's the uh, conference room scene with Darth Vader. And we know it's Darth Vader because one of the admirals around the table says, it's Grand Moff Tarkin and Darth Vader. Oh, is that who that is? I, I thought it may be him, but in the light, it could have been anybody, couldn't it? We then have the discussion that we're all very familiar with, with one or two slight differences. For a start, Darth Vader refers to something that he calls the cosmic force. The cosmic force, okay. And then the biggest uh, addition, the biggest change, is that he seems to be drinking a glass of milk. At least he says, I find your lack of faith disturbing. Not sure if it has the same effect whilst standing there with a glass of milk in your hand, Darth. Oh, they were sitting around the table thinking, how's he going to drink that? Guess where we're going next? Correct, Tatooine. And we see that the Jawas have brought a selection of droids to the Lars homestead. And no, Uncle Owen, that isn't an R2-D2 model. 
It's R5, D4, as everybody knows. Although in fairness, Luke does refer to him as an R2 unit in the film. Of course, as we all know, the R2 unit has a bad motivator. So he's replaced with R2-D2 and the droids uh, trot off with Luke towards the homestead. Once there, we see Luke telling 3PO uh, that he can just call him Luke. We all know the punchline to that one, don't we? And then whilst he's working on R2, he discovers the message from Princess Leia. And she recounts it. She says what is arguably the most iconic line from the entire franchise. Kind of. When she says, Obi-Wan Kenobi, help me. You're my only hope. Yeah, the right words, not necessarily in the right order. But it is interesting because, of course, at this time, the film hasn't been released. They didn't know if it would be a hit or not. They certainly uh, didn't predict that it would be the phenomenon it turned out to be. And so they're not quite so strict about sticking to things exactly as they were on the screen. Some lines, some moments, some scenes are represented slightly differently. Some scenes are dropped entirely. For example, there's no binary sunset scene in this. How can you have Star Wars without Luke looking at Tattoo 1, Tattoo 2? Oh, you didn't know those were the names of the sons? Well, it's in the novelization. He's right, you know. It says here on page 19, metal and stone structures bleached white by the glaze of twin Tattoo 1 and 2 huddled together tightly for company as much as for protection. I don't even know what that means. So Luke has seen the message from Leia and he discusses it with his Uncle Owen the next morning. Of course, Uncle Owen doesn't want him to get involved and he wants nothing to do with that crazy old man, Ben Kenobi. One line that always does my head in whenever I see Star Wars is when Luke says, that's a whole nother year, as though nother is a separate word from a, does my head in. They correct that here, as he says, but that means another year. Another good thing about this being a comic is you can't hear his whiny voice going on about power converters or a whole nother year. And is that Aunt Beru? Later that evening, Luke discovers that R2 has gone missing and Freepio tells him that R2 was babbling on about some mission that he had to complete. Luke scans the horizon using his electro binoculars. And then he says about the fact that that little droid is going to get him into a whole world of trouble. And 3PO says, um, he excels at that, sir. These asteroid droids? Unfortunately for our heroes, the stormtroopers have arrived on Tatooine. And there is a representation of that classic shot of the stormtrooper picking up the metal ring and saying, look, sir, droids. There is also a representation of that not quite so classic scene of C-3PO driving the land speeder. Luke and 3PO catch up with R2. But when they do, R2 lets out a warning. And Freepio says, R2 says there are several creatures approaching rapidly from the southeast. Luke says, sand people, or worse. He scans for them using his electro binoculars. And while he's looking for them, he says a line which always confused me when I saw the film. Um, he says, yeah, they're sand people, all right. I see one of them now. And when I first saw this film, it wasn't at the cinema, it was on TV. And this was in the days where TVs weren't widescreen, they were the more boxy ratio. And so they cropped the picture. And the view we had looking through the binoculars was, if I remember rightly, just of the Banthers. And he said, yes, they're sand people, right? I can see one now. And then the next thing you know, he's attacked by a sand person. So I guess it was just trying to be funny? I don't know, weird. But of course, now that we've all seen the widescreen version, you do see a sand person walking around in the distance. And then he's attacked by one, as he is here. We get a brief but dynamic fight scene, and he's left with the Tuscan Raider holding his uh, gaffy stick high above Luke's head, poised to kill. Imagine reading this comic a month or so before the film came out. You would kill for a ticket, wouldn't you? It's a great start to the adaptation, even with the inaccuracies. And how about this for a cover? Mum, Dad, this comic is a film. Take me to see it. Let's see if Ben really does wield a red lightsaber. We rejoin Luke where we left him, which is at the mercy of the sand people. They're rifling through the land speeder when a noise spooks them and they run off. 
the noise turns out to be Ben Kenobi. And look at this, what a great illustration of Alec Guinness. And it's not a one-off either, because there's another one on the next page, when he says, quickly son, they're on the move, which is a line that it's hard to hear without it then being followed by a upwards screen wipe. Back at Ben's house, we see Leia's message conveyed, and she mentions the name of her father, Bail Antilles. Antilles. They really wanted to use that name, didn't they? But they just couldn't settle on whose name it was. We then have Ben explaining a bit of the history, the background to Jedi Knights and what happened to Luke's father. And he says, your father wanted you to have this when you were old enough, and hands him the lightsaber. He also says he wants Luke to come with him to Alderaan, but Luke says he can't. He's not going to Alderaan. Um, he's, he's a farmer, basically. On the Death Star, Princess Leia is about to be interrogated. And we all know what the interrogation droid looks like, don't we? Yeah? Well, who's that then? Luke and Ben and the droids, uh, meanwhile, find the Jawa Sandcrawler that's been attacked by stormtroopers. And of course, they work out that if the stormtroopers traced the droids to the Sandcrawler, then they would have traced them back home. And Luke shoots off back home. We don't see the charred bodies, though, I guess because it is, at the end of the day, a comic. On the Death Star, to go hand in hand with the great likeness of Alec Guinness from earlier on, we've got a great likeness of Peter Cushing here. Then how Chaykin uh, completes his hat trick with a brilliant uh, rendition of the scene of the heroes in the land speeder with the sand troopers around them looking for the droids. Really good. But that's not before Ben Kenobi utters one of the greatest lines in cinema history. You won't find a more wretched hive of villainy. You're ruining all the best lines. Then it's on to everyone's favourite, the Cantina scene, where Luke falls foul of a couple of patrons and Ben has to get involved. And there's a definite hint of red to that lightsaber. But I forgive them. I forgive them because of this next picture with great shadows on Ben's face. And look at the bottom. Is that Walrus Man's hand? Did you ever wonder why the stormtroopers entered the cantina in the first place? In the film, we see just before they go in the cantina that they are outside talking to someone in the street. And C-3PO says, I don't like the look of this. There is an earlier unreleased cut that shows that person they're talking to coming out of the cantina and actually calling them over. So he informs on what's happened in the cantina. And we kind of get a version of that in this. Although in this version, the informant isn't human as he is in the film. He is some kind of purple alien. But nonetheless, it's he that approaches the stormtroopers. Back inside, Luke and Ben meet Han and Chewie and discuss arrangements for taking them to Alderaan. They then leave and Han, of course, is joined by Greedo. Now this will be interesting. I wonder who they will show shoots for, oh, blimey. Well, that's clear. Then, after Luke sells his land speeder, it's time for another scene cut from the original theatrical release as Han Solo meets up with Jabba the Hutt. Huh? Clearly, this isn't the large slug-like Jabba the Hutt that we're all familiar with. It isn't even the human version that was originally used. Lucasfilm had told Marvel by this point that this scene was going to be cut from the final version of the film, but they said they could use it if they wanted to. And they also said they could use the design for a character called Ming or Mingo uh, that was in a uh, shot that was cut from the Cantina scene. He also made his way into the goddamn holiday special. After Jabba and his cronies leave, the stormtroopers arrive. And with Luke and Ben on board the Millennium Falcon, it's time for them to escape from Tatooine. They don't get far though, because as soon as they get beyond the atmosphere of the planet, they come across three very manoeuvrable, it seems, Star Destroyers. There's only one thing for it. They have to make the jump into what I like to think of as funky hyperspace. The good guys continue to hold red, or at least pink lightsabers, on the cover of issue three, as we see that Leia finally joins the team. Once we get past the logo at the top of the page, 
I mean, what are we? Five? We join Princess Leia, Grand Moff Tarkin, and Darth Vader aboard the Death Star. They're overlooking Alderaan, and Grand Moff Tarkin, of course, is trying to get the location of the hidden uh, rebel base from Princess Leia. Speaking of Grand Moff Tarkin, what a fantastic portrait of Peter Cushing. Of course, Princess Leia doesn't divulge the location of the secret hidden base, so Grand Moff Tarkin orders for Alderaan to be destroyed. Now, have you ever wondered what time it was that Han, Luke and the others arrived at what was Alderaan? We can tell you. The last time we saw them, they were stuck in funky hyperspace, and they're still there. However, Han Solo does point out that he calculates their arrival at Alderaan at 2 o'clock in the morning. So they're not there yet. They've got time to fill. And Luke does this by engaging in some kind of training with the remote. And that is definitely, again, a red lightsaber. Regardless, as we know, once he's put the helmet on with the blast shield down and reached out of his feelings, he doesn't do too badly. Shortly after that, the ship emerges from hyperspace to where Alderaan should be, but isn't. Instead, they come across what they think is some kind of meteor storm and a TIE fighter. And is that TIE fighter reversing? Then, of course, they see what they think is a small moon. Well, if it is a small moon, it's an incredibly small moon. Because this is another occasion where the fact that this comic was written and drawn before the finished film had been seen uh, shows up. Because the Death Star isn't anywhere near the size it is on the big screen. Luke says, would you look at the size of that thing? Um, okay, yeah, well, it's about the size of a large building, I suppose. The Millennium Falcon is drawn into the Death Star and our heroes hide and then manage to get hold of a couple of Stormtrooper outfits so they can infiltrate the base and get up to the control room. Now one of the issues I have with comic book adaptations of films is sometimes they're so keen to uh, replicate what's on the screen that in comic book form it's not really clear what's happened because of course you can't see movement. You can indicate it but you can't see the movement. So if you hadn't seen the film, would you know how Chewbacca just suddenly appeared standing next to that officer? Once our heroes are safely inside the control room, they work out how to deactivate the tractor beam that's holding the Millennium Falcon in place. But Obi-Wan Kenobi says that that is a task that he has to go and do alone. And look at that picture. There is so much hidden meaning and portent in that picture. There's little doubt that Obi-Wan isn't going to return from this. R2, meanwhile, has found her the princess. Luke, of course, wants to save her. Han, not so much. Nonetheless, they work out a plan using their disguises and putting some uh, cuffs on Chewbacca to infiltrate the detention center. Now, this is an interesting example where the comic has totally changed my understanding of what happens. You got the scene where they go into the detention center. Uh, Chewbacca breaks free of the cuffs and they start shooting. They shoot the cameras, all that kind of thing. Now, I always thought that they used the disguises to get into the detention center and once there, try to do all the damage. But here, it's explained that they were still pretending they were stormtroopers even in the detention center. Chewie broke free of his cuffs and they were pretending to be trying to shoot him. But they kept on missing and hitting the security cameras, the other stormtroopers. It's totally changed my understanding of what happened. And it's confirmed here in these text boxes. Next moment, Luke and Han are blasting away. Their reaction, excellent. Their enthusiasm, undeniable. Their aim, execrable. I admit, I had to look it up. But execrable means rubbish, basically. So they should still fit in with the other stormtroopers. But it clarifies even further. Not a single shot comes close to the raging Wookiee. Instead, they blast automatic camera, energy rate controls, and somewhere along the line, two of the troopers. There is an officer in the room, and just as he's about to reach for the alarm, he gets shot the hell out of. With the personnel out of the way, Luke sets off to find the princess. Han embarks on a conversation that turns out to be boring, and then lets Luke know that they're going to have company. Luke has found the cell, and then we have the legendary meeting between him and Leia, and that little bit of banter where she says, aren't you a little short for a stormtrooper? And he says, what? Oh, the uniform. I've come to rescue you. I'm Luke Skywalker. They're doing this on purpose, aren't they? 
Stormtroopers do arrive rapidly and our heroes are trapped in the detention center. And then we are told, next issue, Ben Kenobi versus Darth Vader to the death. They always say that kind of thing in comics. Don't worry about it. So it seems our heroes are in a bit of a tight spot. Will they get out? Pfft. Is Boba Fett a Mandalorian? Actually, I'll tell you what, we better check out the next three issues, just to make sure.